everyone. Um, thank you for joining us for another Trade Justice Alliance Sunday webinar. Um, this is going to be our last one of t 2017. Uh, for those of us in the trade justice movement, um, the idea of a, of a corporate trade agreement that actually lifts people up and, and the planet, quite frankly, seems to us um, a bit like pie in the sky. Um, those of us on the front lines, for example, the victims of forced migrations, indigenous communities, fighting for environmental justice and human rights, and the labor communities uh, really have come to recognize that the, these corporate design systems only work for the global corporate capitalists, uh, and uh, everyone else and everything else is a casualty um, in their for-profit investor schemes. So what we've come to recognize is the only way forward if we – or the planet, or to thrive, or even to survive, is to work in global solidarity with all the world's peoples for a world that will be worth handing down to our children and, and grandchildren. And that is the focus of this webinar tonight. Um, the subject of tonight's webinar is global solidarity and the people's trade agenda. Our guest speakers tonight are Sharon Anglin Treat. She's a senior trade attorney for the Institute for Agriculture and Trade Policy. Eleanor Goldfield, founder and host of the Grassroots Activism and Show Act Out. Christina Garcia, member mobilization manager with Alianza Americas. And Anthony Badal Torres, assistant campaign director with Sierra Club's Responsible Trade Program. I'm just um, going to lay out a few technical details. For those of you that are in phone-only mode, um, and if you do want to join us in the online meeting room, you, could, uh, you would want to join if you want to see the visuals and use the chat box. Just go to tradejustice.net forward slash room, R-O-O-M, and uh, you can just enter your name in the username field. You don't need a password, and then just press enter. If you are unable to log in for some reason, that does happen sometime, you can still watch the presentation by going to our Facebook group, Trade Justice Alliance, and downloading the presentation. My name is Harriet Haywood. I'll be your moderator tonight. The meeting room is courtesy Andrea Milliter. She is the Executive Director of People Demanding Action. And we do ask one room, uh, one uh, thing for our, uh, for our uh, chat box. We ask that you please be respectful of our guest speakers and our, our attendees. We also wanted to uh, mention that you can opt in to receive text reminders a couple hours before these webinars. You can text all in one word, webinar reminder, to 917-791-1131. I would now like to introduce our first guest speaker. Her name is Sharon Anglin Treat. She is a senior attorney at the Institute for Agriculture and Trade Policy. Her work focuses on international trade agreements and their impacts on environmental, food, and agricultural policy. Before joining IATP in 2017, Sharon served 11 terms in the Maine legislature, holding numerous leadership positions, including Senate Majority Leader. She was Executive Director of the National Legislative Association on Prescription Drug Prices from 2004 to 2014. And uh, in that capacity, she brought the voice of state legislators to advocate for greater access to affordable medications. After leaving the legislature, she was a consultant and public speaker working with several organizations, including IATP, the Center for International Environmental Law, and the National Caucus of Environmental Legislators. Sharon serves on the Maine Citizen Trade Policy Commission, and she represents the Commission on the Intergovernmental Policy Advisory Committee to the U.S. Trade Representative. She has taught environmental law at the University of Maine Law School and several colleges, and she has an undergraduate degree from Princeton University's Woodrow Wilson School of uh, public and International Affairs, and she has a law degree from Georgetown University Law Center. 
She lives and works in Hollowell, Maine. Welcome, Sharon. Thank you so much, Harriet, and it's great to be back on this program. Um, So just a little bit of background about IETP, which has been working for over 30 years, uh, both locally and globally, on fair and sustainable food policy, farm, and trade systems. And it's really interesting to think that ITP was started um, right before the first NAFTA came into being, and we're still dealing with the same issues from over 30 years ago, uh, where farmers are in crisis today as they were then, and NAFTA hasn't done anything really to make it better. In fact, it's really exacerbated uh, the the price is going really plunging around this country, overproduction of crops with both uh, farmers in Mexico going out of business as in the United States and Canada really being taken over by an industrialized system. And the big question now is, in negotiating a NAFTA 2.0, is this going to improve anything um, or is it just going to continue these unsustainable and destructive scenarios? Um, next slide. So, unfortunately, you, you know, you kind of get what you pay for, and if you have a negotiation that's on a reckless timetable of just the, the fastest uh, trade negotiation we've ever seen, uh, continuing behind closed doors, uh, it's hard to get something that's a really positive, uh, pro-democratic, sustainable agreement. They're already into the sixth round of negotiations, and these negotiations just started back in, I don't know, was it uh, July? Um, there's a, the last full round is planned for January. They want to have it done by March. And this is a political deadline uh, driven by political considerations such as elections and not based on coming up with the best agreement. And one of the things that I think, you know, looking from the outside, trying to figure out what the heck is going on here, it's important to know that there seems to be a lot of leaking going on from uh, the corporate side uh, about things they don't like. Uh, and so the policies that they hate, which happen to be things that people on this call would support, um, are becoming public. What they're not talking about is what's really going on behind closed doors that may be proceeding quite quickly in in a really bad direction. So next slide. Okay. So I put this little slide together because, to me, this whole process is not only reckless and um, secret, but it's, like, almost nuts, uh, sort of schizophrenic. On the one hand, you have negotiations for this NAFTA modernization, so-called that would essentially insert um, Trans-Pacific Partnership uh, provisions and sometimes even worse than that, um, which is really extreme corporate rights and putting that into this agreement. And and these negotiations appear to be moving fairly swiftly uh, with very few leaks and uh, a lot of agreement apparently going on between the three countries. At the same time, you have a lot of public, uh, you know, uh, noise about proposals coming from the the U.S. um, trade representative that would limit corporate rights in the area of investor state dispute settlement. I'll talk a little bit about that. And it's being strongly opposed by all these corporations and uh, supported by civil society. And then on the other hand, you have uh, President Trump saying, well, he's just going to blow up the whole thing if, if it doesn't go the way he wants in the next couple of weeks and withdraw from NAFTA completely, and so maybe absolutely nothing will happen. Uh, And so all of these things are happening all at once, and um, it it doesn't seem to be setting the stage for a really um, thoughtful, positive process. Next slide. So let's talk about modernization. Um, To me, modernizing NAFTA is really a euphemism for inserting extreme corporate ribbons provisions into the agreement. And I picked this one. You're going to hear more about the energy provisions, I think, later in this um, presentation from other people. But here is an example of something that's a horrible uh, provision in the current NAFTA that only applies to Canada, does not apply to Mexico. It's basically a mandatory export provision for um, fossil fuels that makes it virtually impossible to address uh, uh, climate change 
uh, by limiting uh, the production and export of fossil fuels uh, to go in a different direction uh, uh, from a domestic policy. And here you see Canada supporting Mexico's proposal to, to, to basically bind him itself by rules that limit its opportunity to, to set its own policies and to do positive policies. So here's something that is apparently um, speeding right along uh, behind closed doors. And on this list of things that are so-called modernization, we can also add up uh, food safety deregulation, loosening financial services regulations, digital policies that we're going to hear more about later tonight, uh, provisions about prescription drug prices and trying to uh, make it more difficult for governments to limit those prices, provisions on labeling of food, even for things like calorie counts and uh, nutrition, as well as uh, chemical um, labeling and things like that. And just to go back to this energy chapter, you know, this is a quote from um, Senator Lindsey Graham from last week talking about why this would be the greatest uh, idea. He said, I, don't know, I am quoting from an article, um, that would be the biggest win of all if you had a North American energy policy where you could build pipelines all over the place. So this is, that was my scary quote from last week, and I think if this is what NAFTA is turning into, it's, it's, it's really scary. Okay, next slide. So NAFTA also could be turning into basically a zombie trans-Pacific partnership. Uh, in addition to, you know, beefing up things from the existing NAFTA, there's a lot of proposals coming from the corporate side. Uh, and apparently, as we read the, the trade press, such as the uh, World Trade Online um, example here, um, these uh, discussions are, are moving along quite well. Um, and so one example of uh, a very bad policy from the Trans-Pacific Partnership that uh, the Farm Bureau and the biotech industry are advocating to be moved into NAFTA is this one on biotech that would essentially, uh, if in fact they're doing what the TPP proposed and what the Farm Bureau wants, would allow for low-level um, genetically engineered content that not, had not even been approved uh, in uh, any of the NAFTA countries to be imported into uh, the countries um, if it was approved somewhere else, though, that low-level content. That's just one example of a really extreme policy that essentially takes away our domestic uh, sovereignty and promotes a particular policy and a particular product, in this case, um, GMO. Um, next slide. So in addition to the, the sort of zombie TPP provisions, such as the biotech or maybe prescription drugs, other things we don't really know, um, Canada has recently entered into a trade agreement with the European Union, which has some very extreme provisions relating to so-called regulatory cooperation, regulatory uh, harmonization. These are provisions that are essentially a deregulatory agenda intended to, to give corporations a preferred seat at the table outside of the process that we normally do for passing legislation and coming up with new regulations, but really more under the trade um, uh, over Oversight and following trade rules, and as we know from how trade agreements are negotiated, they're very much in secret. Civil society uh, and advocates are not uh, very much at the table, um, but corporations are. And so there's a real concern that Canada, uh, and again, if you read uh, these articles from the trade press, they're all talking about, let's, yeah, one thing we can all agree on, you know, we don't like some of this other stuff, but that regulatory cooperation and those provisions are really great. And all three countries, you know, want to move ahead on this. And certainly we've seen the Trump administration doing this through Congress, and this would be in Ensuring those same de deregulatory um, approaches into a trade agreement. And so I think we need to worry that the Canadians may be moving and agreeing to things that they've already agreed to with the European Union and putting these into NAFTA as well. Next slide. Okay, so um, the question is, is there anything positive coming out of this? And one of the, some of the proposals that um, have become somewhat public are about limitations to investor state dispute settlement um, coming from Robert Lighthizer, who is the trade, um, the U.S. trade representative. Uh, these are, have been labeled as poison pills by the Chamber of Commerce and um, essentially 
um, these companies have set, and all of the corporate corporations that are involved in, in these discussions and, and advocacy around NAFTA have said these are completely unacceptable. We will not agree to any NAFTA agreement that has anything to do with this. And frankly, Canada and Mexico have not been um, supportive as well, at least publicly. So the question is whether, you know, there's any possibility that this agreement could in fact do something on the positive side taking away um, some of the extreme corporate rights that um, are out there now that allow corporations to challenge government policies and, and public protections because they say they limit uh, their their profits, um, their future profits. Um, I am skeptical. Same thing with labor, human rights, and environment standards being beefed up. Uh, I think it's uh, highly unlikely. We haven't seen much specificity, specificity around any of these proposals to believe that they're going to happen. Um, I'm willing to be proven wrong, and certainly this is an area where um, the public can certainly advocate and should be advocating in support of these strengthened provisions and 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 reduced um, corporate rights uh, if, if, if it's at all possible. Go for it. Uh, next slide. Um, and then to my third point, of course, we have um, Trump saying, well, let's just blow the whole thing up if I don't get my way in the next couple of weeks. Um, and I, I think the important thing here is to understand that we should not allow this sort of bullying behavior to um, force us or force negotiators into accepting an agreement that is not um, a positive, um, democratic, sustainable uh, agreement that promotes you know, enhanced human rights, that promotes um, fair trade, that promotes you know, sustainable agriculture, uh, that you know, supports uh, the rights of indigenous people, uh, that improves, you know, um, our, our, our wages and um, our public protections. I mean, this is what an agreement should do. And I think there's been a lot of almost fear-mongering around what might happen if, in fact, the, uh, the president were to say, you know, we're going to withdraw from NAFTA. Uh, it's not as if there would be no rules whatsoever out there. The World Trade exists, Organization still exists. There are rules around uh, tariffs, and many of the tariffs except for products that are currently traded under NAFTA, are already at very low levels under the World Trade Organization. It's not to say that's the case for all um, of, of, of the economy. It's not to say that there wouldn't be some disruption. But it is to say that there's a strong interest among all three countries to make uh, trade work even without a NAFTA, and that we shouldn't allow um, these kinds of threatening tactics to force people to agree to what will be an even worse NAFTA that we have right now. Next slide. So to get back to the, you know, our point for tonight's um, activities and, and what, what we're, we want to talk about, you know, right from the beginning of these uh, negotiations and before that with the TPP fights, uh, civil society organizations in Mexico, in Canada, and in the United States, including IATP and uh, other organizations that are on the call with us right now, uh, have been working uh, together to come up with a platform on the right. We have, I have a picture from meetings that took place, hundreds of activists, educators, farmers, uh, you know, environmentalists, I mean, from all over, um, the, from the three different countries met in Mexico City to come up with a trinational declaration saying this is the kind of trade agreement that we would support. The NAFTA we have right now is unacceptable, and the NAFTA that's being talked about by these corporations is unacceptable. And we came together with a uh, declaration and a platform, and you see on the left a picture from Ottawa where back in October um, many of these same organizations and individuals went to the negotiations up there and provided this information to parliamentarians and negotiators and held several days of meetings around strategy and learning about the issues and now are continuing to work on these issues because if we are going to affect uh, this, uh, these negotiations, which, as I said, are going on at a reckless pace, they're going on in secrecy, um, they're going under on these kinds of bullying, um, threatening behaviors by uh, Trump, um, that is not a scenario that's going to result in, in a good agreement. So the only way that we'll have uh, something positive coming out is if we continue to have these kinds of activities, not 
basically pitting one country against another, not pitting some organizations and individuals against another, but working in solidarity together to come up with a united front. It's not America first. It's not Canada first. It's not Mexico first. You know, it's people first. It's people and the environment first. And we need to make sure that that is what happens. So just to um, finish up, uh, this next week is a week of negotiations in Washington, D.C. There is a whole range of activities that are going on that people can participate in from all over the country. And I know Anthony later in the call is going to give you um, the details about how to do that. There's going to be a thunderclap. There's going to be a day of action on the 13th on Wednesday. So this is the opportunity now to make our voices heard so that this doesn't turn into a train wreck, but really turns into something positive um, that we can get behind and support. So next slide. And that is just some contact information, which you already have. We have I, one thing I wanted to mention is the IETP has a, port, a NAFTA portal on its website. Everything we've ever done on NAFTA, going back to before the first NAFTA and right up to the last couple of uh, days, um, with lots of information and analysis of a whole lot of issues, podcasts, uh, as well as access to fact sheets and other things. So that might be something you might want to check out uh, going forward on this issue. Great. Thanks. Thank you so much, Sharon. Um, as usual, you are uh, an amazing source of information. Now, if anyone has a question for Sharon, please press star 6 on your phone, and then you'll be asked to press a 1. I have a question, um, Sharon, in the meantime, while people are lining up here to ask questions. Hopefully, sure. um, in uh, in your work uh, when you were up in Canada or in any of your other work, uh, what is your opinion um, as to uh, what the chances are for an Indigenous chapter in NAFTA? I know uh, Chief Perry Belgard was actually uh, calling for uh, a NAFTA or a, a, an Indigenous uh, rights chapter in NAFTA. Yeah, and certainly the Canadians have actually proposed that. That's a publicly, you know, that's been a public proposal of theirs. Um, I have not heard or seen anything from the American side that is supportive of that. Um, you know, we'll have to see. One of the things I think we need to keep an eye on is that, you know, uh, what's important is what's in the whole agreement. And having... Um, a chapter, whether it's called the environment chapter, the labor chapter, the indigenous people's chapter, uh, if you have a very, if you still have uh, investor state dispute settlement, which can bring, you know, lawsuits against you for turning down, say, the Keystone XL pipeline, which certainly affects indigenous rights, then it doesn't really mean very much. So I think that we have to keep our eye on the ball and make sure that the agreement as a whole uh, is a good agreement. And um, I think sometimes we focus on these different chapters. I know that the Canadians have proposed that chapter, but I have not heard anything positive yet from the U.S. government in terms of supporting it. Yeah, that's, that's too bad. Of course, you would want it to be enforceable, and in order for it to be enforceable, uh, you would want to eliminate some of these other conditions like the ISDS. So, right. You. I mean, that, that yeah. and just on that point uh, around the labor and environmental standards, I mean, there's been talk about this, but it, it, there's very little talk about making it actually really enforceable and very little detail coming from our government in terms of they're actually proposing things to the extent that there's been strong uh, labor proposals. They've been coming from the Canadians again, for example, going after U.S. states' uh, right-to-work laws uh, which are, are, should be overturned, but you don't hear the U.S. government supporting that or certainly any of the corporate uh, supporters of the NAFTA negotiations. Yeah, yeah. yeah they're not going to do it willingly, are they? <laughs> okay. Uh, uh, Carrie, you're running the call board there, right? Yes, we have okay. a couple people in the queue if you guys are ready. Our first yes. question comes from Paul. Paul, your line is open. Thank you. Sharon, you mentioned how um, Trump, is, Trump is threatening a bullying tactic, tactic by getting us withdrawn from NAFTA altogether. My thought is NAFTA is the cause of so much strife and trial and tribulation. It's been it's, it, the threat of, uh, with NAFTA has um, 
been leveraged to reenact the Keystone XL pipeline, for example. Um, there's mm-hmm. other lawsuits uh, in the pipeline, no pun intended, uh, as a result of NAFTA being uh, the leveraging force. So suppose they just throw it out the window. Why wouldn't that be a better thing altogether? Yeah, well, and I'm not saying that it wouldn't be necessarily. I mean, I think that a lot there, – there's different points of view on this. Um, you know, there's some, especially in Mexico, that would like to see the whole agreement thrown out. Um, there's many others in the United States that say, well, you know, we should renegotiate it and make it better. My point was not that um, NAFTA – falling apart or us getting out of NAFTA was a a terrible thing. It was more not to let fear of that uh, limit our options. I mean, getting out of NAFTA would, in fact, end the ICS provisions, the investor state provisions, um, going forward. It it wouldn't end its application to, um, you know, disputes that had already, you know, come into being. But going forward, I mean, that would be a very positive, you know, that would be a quick way of, of addressing that issue without going through these, you know, negotiations. Um, but the fact of the matter is we have been, um, you know, in an economy that's been governed by these NAFTA rules for quite a long time. And it, it, unraveling that right away does, you know, it's probably going to cause some disruption just to be, you know, honest about it. I mean, mm-hmm. it doesn't mean that it, it would necessarily uh, in the end be a bad thing. But it's just to acknowledge that you just don't snap your fingers and completely change the whole way the economy is run. You know, you can't do that. Um, my concern is more that there's a lot of the, the material written about this has been by, from most of the corporations that are very much opposed to um, changes in NAFTA. And they, to some extent, I think there's been some fear-mongering about what would happen if we were to withdraw from NAFTA. And I think it's just important. We all need to look at it. There would be rules in place even without NAFTA. It's not like you're suddenly, you know, plunged into chaos. And obviously there's a strong interest on the part of all three countries to make sure that our economies, you know, get, you know are improved as opposed to undermined. So, you know, even without an after, I think that there would be, you know, cooperation to some extent in terms of, you know, making th- pe- things work well for people within each country. Definitely. Okay, thank you. Our next question comes from Nancy. Nancy, your line is open. Oh, hello. Thank you, uh, Harriet, and thank you, Sharon, very much. This is Nancy Price in Davis, California. Hi, Nancy. Hello. Um, uh, what, what has not been talked about very much is uh, water. And uh, going back to the Security and Prosperity Partnership that was negotiated between Canada, U.S., and Mexico in 2005 and sort of became a dead letter in 2009, Nevertheless, the plan then was not only to have uh, oil and gas pipelines crisscrossing the U.S. and toll roads, but also to have water and, and, and rail, <clears throat> but also to have water pipelines. And could you say something about um, the issue of cross-border trade in water that could uh, really have a huge impact on uh, these three countries and uh, the environment and water is a human right, and water yeah, for ab- nature. <laughs> to say yeah, that. no, a- absolutely. Water is a huge issue, and of course, it's fundamental not only to you know human life, agriculture, everything um, that you know our, our survival. And these um, trade agreements, and certainly NAFTA is no different, and what um, people are trying to achieve in NAFTA in terms of the the corporate agenda that is pushing um, much of it is focused on things like privatization of um, water um, services. That's part of, you know, services. We don't – sometimes we think of services as like going to a fast food restaurant, that's a service industry, but under trade agreements – Pretty much everything can be considered a service, including provision of water. And, uh, you know, whether it's – and this is something like where I live in the state of Maine, we have, you know, Nestle 
uh, international, transnational corporation that owns all of these companies that are pumping out water and turning it into little bottled waters that they're sending all over the country. And we have limited capacity to address those issues because of the existence of provisions in NAFTA and other trade agreements which give corporations the right to challenge uh, our policies uh, if they view them as cutting into their profits and they you know, are often triggered by um, these trade agreements. So yes, and that would be under the ICS provisions, certainly the services provisions. Again, making it difficult to have governments you know, have basically say we're, we're the ones that are providing this and we're providing at, at you know, low cost or, or uh, limited cost um, to, to the public and making decisions that benefit the public that make decisions that benefit the environment. So that is a huge issue and it's one that really um, we need to make sure is addressed you know, in, in any new trade agreement, including NAFTA. Okay, thank you. We do have one more caller in the queue. Caller, your line is open. Okay, basically um, what I was thinking was if various rules are in place without NAFTA, wouldn't it be a good idea to start building arguments, creating memes, uh, creating YouTube videos, daily motion? There are, there are a lot of videos on the YouTube. YouTube's like hired a whole bunch of people to try and censor basically anything they don't like. They said it's extremist content, but probably anything they don't like. And, you know, other sites of that nature to make it clear that we'd be fine without these, uh, these agreements and arguments why this is wrong. I mean, you want to ask, is it wrong? You, 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 we start with the conclusion, it's wrong. And you whip up an argument, and then you figure out how to drive it home. You know what I mean? Yeah, no, if the rules are actually, if the ahead. rules are in place, if the rules are in place, you know, like that without NAFTA, then there's no real justification for NAFTA. So the argument would be to like start whipping up arguments, basically uh, that this is a bad idea, and that we could do without NAFTA. You know what I mean? Yeah, well, I mean, the rules that are in place are World Trade Organization rules, and you know, there's controversy about some of those rules as well, and and the World Trade Organization system. But the fact of the matter is that if, in fact, NAFTA were to go away, World Trade Organization rules, such as what a tariff would be, you know, what kinds of taxes and excise tax and tariffs you can put onto a product that you are exporting or importing. Um, back and forth across borders. So those are rules that are there. One of the things that um, is different with the WTO system from NAFTA and some of these other trade agreements is it does not have these corporate um, court systems, the ISDF. So it, under the World Trade Organization, it's a nation-to-nation um, dispute settlement. Now, those are still you know, controversial, and there's still problems with that because it's because of the World Trade Organization decision that, you know, we repealed our country of origin labeling, for example. So it's not that the World Trade Organization necessarily is, you know, everything there is benign. That said, though, it does not include some of the most extreme provisions that are were proposed in the Trans-Pacific Partnership and that are in um, agreements like that as well as NAFTA, including ISDS. I had a question for you, uh, Sharon. Uh, this is Harriet. One other one, just really quick. I wonder if you might um, explain uh, the terms regulatory uh, cooperate, cooperation and coherence. Um, for a lot of people on here, they might not know um, what that meant and uh, how it might apply to trade deals like NAFTA. Sure. I mean, it's really, it's you know, it's hard to talk about something that sounds like so benign and then explain like this is a really, really terrible idea. So, you know, you talk about cooperation. Who wouldn't like cooperation? But the idea about these proposals is to essentially um, make it more difficult to come up with and to enact through a democratic process, which would be our Congress, as difficult as that Congress is and our regulatory agencies um, that protect, say, food safety or that comes up with rules around um, chemicals and which ones should be allowed and which ones, you know, uh, what kind of uh, policies you have for applications of pesticides or whatever. And so the goal with regulatory um, cooperation and also harmonization of rules is to try to have pretty much the same regulations um, in between countries. So in this case, it would be Canada, U.S., and Mexico. 
And to get to the point where you have those um, same rules, it would put in place a process where these regulators and trade officials from these different countries would get together in advance and try to hash out what the policies are. The goal is, and, and the criteria that is used, would make it um, more difficult to um, establish these policies because it basically creates a high bar in order to, to um, enact regulations. So basically <coughs> it puts, puts in place a lot of hoops you have to jump through, including you know, cost-benefit analysis. And the goal is to reduce the regulation as much as possible so that the cost of business are less. It's getting together essentially behind closed doors to work out regulatory policies in a way that, you know, essentially reduces the cost on business. And it's doing that through a trade agreement, which, as we know, is enforceable through the, all these, you know, provisions, and it's not doing it necessarily through the, the democratic process. Um, and that is an anti-democratic approach, and it's essentially a deregulatory approach. And, you know, so. I wonder if that might, uh, like, apply to, like, our transportation and uh, those uh, types of things. You know, like, um, uh, for example, all the fracking that's being done and transported all around the country. I wonder if, uh, is that part of the process? Yeah, it could. Yeah, it could apply to absolutely everything. I mean, the goal is, you know, the, in, in trade terminology, they talk, there's tariffs, which are the monies that you, you know, like taxes that are on products that are imported from another country. And then there's something that they call a non-tariff barrier. To our mind, that's a, a public protection provision, like something that would protect water quality from fracking, Okay. But from the point of view of a corporation, that's a non-tariff barrier because it's making it hard to, you know, uh, uh, put in place your fracking and to sell more uh, and more uh, gas and oil, you know, as a result. So those regulations are considered to be barriers to trade because it makes it more difficult to make money. Mm -hmm. They're reasonable barriers. They make sense. They, they're there for, for reasons of protecting the public, of protecting the environment, uh, and governments should be allowed to continue to put in place those protective policies. But under these trade agreements, the goal is to get rid of them to the maximum extent possible to reduce it down to the lowest common denominator so that corporations do not have to spend the money that they would have to spend for, you know, protective provisions or that they simply, you know, can't be prevented from doing certain things. So, for example, the Keystone XL pipeline, the challenges to, to the Obama decision to deny a permit, that's a perfect example of the kinds of um, policy that would be considered a non-tariff barrier and challenged in this ISDS procedure. And the goal of regulatory cooperation is to actually get in ahead of the time of having those regulations put in place in the first place and have the governments get together between the three countries and kind of basically work out their problems up ahead and essentially in a process where corporations have uh, a seat at the table. Okay. That was very helpful. Thank you, Sharon. Okay. Um, well, thank you very much, Sharon. I know, uh, I believe, our, our, if you're on the road, uh, we understand if you can't stay with us. Um, but uh, please stick around and make the use of the chat box if you can. And uh, we hope we'll be able to have you on another time. Thank you. Great. Well, thanks for having me. You're quite welcome. All right, well, I would like to um, announce our next speaker. Her name is Christina Garcia. She is a member mobilization manager with Alianza Americas. In this capacity, Christina leads Alianza's U.S. speaking tours, and this is an initiative that brings real-life experiences from Latin America to the U.S. as a way to address social, economic, and racial justice issues. Christina has a solid 15-year track record of service in the nonprofit sector, and as such, she brings a wealth of knowledge in the areas of program development, communications, community outreach, civic engagement, and policy advocacy. She served in various leadership roles at Erie Neighborhood House, one of the most respected 
social service institutions in Chicago, Illinois, and her work has focused largely on immigrant rights. She has worked with diverse immigrant communities locally, nationally, and internationally, ensuring that immigrant voices are heard and are part of the decision-making process at every level in our democracy. Christina is the granddaughter of Bracero migrant workers, and she is the daughter of Mexican immigrants. She holds a master's degree from the University of Chicago School of Social Service Administration and a bachelor's degree in business administration from Robert Morris University. Christina is a 2015 fellow of the American Express Aspen Leadership Academy and an alumni of the Latino Policy Forum's nonprofit leadership program in 2013. Welcome, Christina. Thank you, Harriet and Mara and everybody else on here for your presentation. Um, so I'll just get started talking a little bit about what Alianza America is, who we are and what we do. We are the um, one of the only networks, if not the only one in the United States, that is comprised of uh, immigrant-led institutions. Um, we have about 50 uh, member institutions around the United States. And uh, what we act, we act as a platform um, to really sort of have a voice around issues of economic and social justice on all things pertaining to immigrants as an organized body in the United States. We also have, um, we also have partnerships and alliances in Latin America, particularly in Mexico and Central America. What we do is, uh, well, we try to influence policy at uh, both the local, um, state, and uh, national, international levels. We do that by partnering with uh, our members who have their ears and uh, feet on the ground. We do that by going into our countries of origin, um, sitting down at the table with Mexican authorities, Central American authorities, as, as difficult as that might be. Um, and we also uh, put our immigrant voices at the forefront of everything we do. Um, so just to, these are just a couple of slides to bring people up to speed in terms of what the NASA original goals were. And um, we you know, just want to take it back to NASA's in, original intention was never to serve uh, people's best interests. Um, we, you know, we, we know because of the specifics written in these agreements that it was mostly to really look at the, the flow of commerce and goods and services. It was supposed to create investment in capital throughout North America. It was supposed to do this by lifting tariffs and other barriers to trade um, and overall really lifting any, any protections that people or workers had um, and really kind of giving the upper hand to all um, capitalists and investors. Some of the facts that we know around NAFTA is that uh, it was signed in 1993 by President Clinton. Um, it actually has quadrupled the number of exports to Canada and Mexico, mostly Mexico, um, from 93, going from 8.9 billion all the way to 38.6 billion in 2015. There are currently 14 free trade agreements throughout the world across 20 countries, um, and they total 43% of U.S. agricultural exports. Um, NAFTA is one of the oldest, most comprehensive trade, trade agreements in the, in the United States. Um, and then just to remind us again that these, this specific deal was, again, made to benefit corporations but not people. I think um, Sharon talked about this particular provision, which is Chapter 11 in NAFTA, that essentially um, allows the corporations to have the privilege to um, basically have all kinds of um, access to generating profit and remove any – they essentially have their own tribunal in which they operate, um, being able to challenge sort of any – any uh, entities that might come in and try to disrupt their profit making. Um, so they do have like their own court systems, which is kind of hard to imagine, but they're kind of, uh, they, they usually have their own lawyers, team of lawyers, and that, that basically blocking any types of collective bargaining rights for people. Um, this obviously makes it very difficult for workers to, you know, kind of really push them and, 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 um, organize around their rights. Um, so it basically 
it, it, any any infringement on, on corporations to really um, to do the right thing, this is kind of taken away. So now, what what did NAFTA promise us? It basically promised more jobs and opportunities. It promised that it would bring Mexico out of out of poverty. It it talked about food insecurity, being able to expand food supply. Uh, boost the incomes in Mexico, increase demand for a greater volume and variety of food and feed products from U.S. farmers, reduce unauthorized Mexican migration to the United States, and it just really put, put, put up this nice picture that everyone wins, which we all know that is not the case. What were the actual, what are the actual effects uh, of NAFTA? Well, we see that, first of all, 2 million workers were displaced from the years 91 to 2007. We see that Mexico lost uh, about 20 to 25 percent of its farm jobs between the, these years. Um, right now, about 70 percent of, rural, of people in, the rural, in rural areas live in poverty. Um, this really, uh, what this propelled was the displacement of workers. Uh, the separation of families. Many people left their homes in the in rural communities in search for you know better jobs, propelling everybody north, if not into the cities. So this massive exodus from people living in, in rural communities, you know, being able to be self-sustainable with their smaller um, uh, pieces of you know uh, or um, their local farming. Um, and I mean, all of this has. Further, been we wanted to talk a little bit about you know how this has exacerbated has been exacerbated by U.S. immigration policy. Um, of course, we know that due to U.S. domestic po immigration policy, a lot of these migrants have been criminalized here in the United States. Um, you know, for the mere fact of you know be working without documentation. So we know that immigrants are being being used as scapegoats um, because of this. Um, another thing, uh, health, really, you know, the, the deterioration of health is one of the key uh, things about, you know, some of the side effects of NAFTA. Uh, currently, 20 million people in Mexico are, you know, suffer from malnutrition or anemia. Um, obesity levels have skyrocketed. About 35 million people live in, um, I mean, well, they, they suffer from obesity, and a lot of this, a lot I I'm not going to go into detail, but a lot of this is uh, due, due to a lot of these uh, corn syrup, artificial sweet, sweeteners that have been introduced to their, uh, to their meals um, as a result of NAFTA's sort of incoming of transnational corporations. We know all of the Coke and Pepsis and Nestle products and all of these, um, these other transnational corporations. It also gave the rise to implementation of maquiladoras. Um, which is, you know, we know that these are sweatshops, sweatshops, I'm sorry. A lot of these are concentrated along the, um, the northern parts of Mexico. They're also all over Central America, particularly Honduras and, and, and many other uh, countries. So what these do is they really, really squeeze cheap labor out of the uh, Mexican economy. So we, you know, they're, prof they're, they're very attractive to U.S. and, 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 and other corporations, uh, from other countries because of the fact that they can pay so, so little. And again, because these maquiladoras are not, um, they fall under the provision of these free trades, which again have their own sort of sovereignty and they, they don't, they basically operating outside of the sort of economic um, labor practices uh, of the country. Um, and, uh, and of course, again, we saw small scale, scale farmers they're not able to compete with these large agribusinesses. So these are all of the Walmarts, um, a lot of the meat packers, meat packing companies that, you know, they just, it's, it's an uneven trade, an, an uneven uh, or unfair trade practice. And then just to show, just to blow it up a little bit, you can see here in this next slide, the share of total U.S. exports for free trade agreement countries, and the, these are many of the sectors in which are effect, we're affected. And by this, um, not, Mexico is not the only country that is affected. I mean, our own country in the United States, we're, we're seeing small, same, the same kind of pattern, right? Maybe not as to the effects of what they're seeing in, in, in Mexico because of the added poverty levels. But and nevertheless, um, we know that Midwest farmers have suffered greatly 
Um, we, we know California um, and all of the problems, right, that, that some of these um, uh, farm owners are having, um, not, even, not even mentioning um, the lack of uh, being able to hire or find sometimes um, 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 labor. Um, let me make sh- let me go- make sure I'm I'm going in order here. I think I skipped a couple of slides. Uh, I'm on slide the impact of NAFTA on Mexico. Um, so yeah, we're so we are seeing right now that in 2013 we had 80% of the main agricultural export of products. For example, tomatoes, avocados, strawberry, raspberry, melons, just the basic staple foods um, were in the hands of foreign corporations. Um, and then these are monopolies that are, you know, directly impacting people there. Um, this chart here, you can see Mexico as importer of corn. This is probably one of the most striking um, graphs that I've seen in which the irony is just so visual. Um, Mexico's staple food has been corn, has been bean, the bean, and now they essentially import more than what they produce or are able to um, you know, be sustained from. Um, so I just talk a little bit about there's this. I'm on this slide. Over the over the years, the Mexican economy has specialized in three commodities, and I all this these because I thought this article was pretty interesting. I, I put the citation on the bottom. Um, it talked about um, it talked about how these three cheap labor, illicit drugs, and illegal immigration have basically converged to form what is the main commodity in Mexico. Cheap labor, we all know why, right? You know, so many corporations moving into Mexico to to derive this cheap labor there. Illicit drugs is another form of an economic, and I guess engine (laughs) for for the economy, Um, and then illegal immigration. And so um, Mexico is not only um, a, you know, uh, exporter of, of, of immigrants, but it's also receiving, it's one of the countries that receives the most immigrants from, from Central America. So what else happens with um, uh, an, another culprit, culprit of migration is essentially this climate change. So some of these patterns, hurricanes, all of these different types of climate changes um, are also being are also a disrupting migration patterns. So this is one thing that we're seeing that we, we, you know, some folks have predicted this before, you know, more than five, 10 years ago or more, but this is, um, you know, something that we're actually explicitly seeing um, even all across our own nation, especially in 2017, it's front and center. This is all we hear about in the news. Um, We are facing these, I mean, and I'm sure that Anthony will go into this a lot more, but we're facing a really severe uh, um, just this forced migration of people that just is, is these hurricanes are continuously displacing people. So they're not only displacing folks from places like, um, you know, not only internally here in the United States, but we're also seeing how uh, places like Puerto Rico, all of these folks, um, you know, you'll see some figures on the, on the slide I provided there, but Puerto Rico is continuously, um, ex, you know, sort of a, a lot of their folks are, are really moving, they're leaving. We don't know um, what this 2017 hurricane will, we don't know the, the, the effects of it yet, um, but based on some of these uh, figures that we have, we have on this chart here, we, there has already been this um, huge increase in the number of Puerto Ricans that have left the island. And that, of course, it could be attributed to some of their, um, you know, their economic instability. Um, but um, nonetheless, um, this hurricane has definitely aggravated the situation. And we think right now, I think that the actual government count was about 60 something, when in reality, um, there's been a couple of uh, news outlets that have reported that they've done independent investigations and they, it's actually more, more than a thousand, which the government is not reporting. Uh, or admitting to. So I just put this other slide on here so we can see that um, climate change and displaced migrants, this is not a new concept. The, these um, patterns have been occurring all over the world. We saw South Asia, some of the disasters that happened there with uh, the 2009 cyclone um, 
in Bangladesh, 2012, we saw, you know, in the northern part of India, this displacement of 1.5 million people. And then bringing it up to the current, uh, Katrina displaced about 30,000 families permanently. And, um, you know, I left a couple of X's under Puerto Rico because we don't know what that will bring us yet. Um, but we suspect it's, it's, it's a high number. Internal displacement is another thing we have to worry about. Uh, I'm on the slide, um, Sharon, with the, uh, or I'm sorry, um, um, Harriet with, <laughs> yes, Harriet with the effects of climate change on people. Um, I know this is all really, really, really stark and bad news, but this is the reality. And so in an effort to really highlight how um, climate change is something that is deeply sort of connected uh, to the migration of people, the forced migration of people, um, and its after effects. So it's, it's a domino effect. Um, so here we see this is actually uh, a, a, a photo of the fires in California I forgot which newspaper article I grabbed this from, but um, we can see that there's quite a few farm workers still working out there picking the crops. And I mean, we we uh, we know that this is bad. This is smoke that they're inhaling. This is really bad for their lungs in the long run. These are uh, many of these workers could be undocumented. We don't, you know, some some might have uh, you know agricultural vi uh, visas, but some may not. So they don't have access to any federal relief programs. They already fear deportation. So they're very likely not to seek help. And, you know, if we see them out there, it's because they need the help. Um, these, I just put this in here, the polar bear, this little guy. This is um, forced migration is not only affecting people, children and families, but also animals. Um, and it's just so you could see, I mean, this really kind of, shook me when I saw this, not that I'm, I'm not desensitized by this, but this little guy is, is like he, this photographer, Paul Nichols, Nicholson, was able to capture him hours before his death. This guy was, um, hmm. this bear was literally, um, had wandered off from, off of the coast of Greenland, they think, uh, around Baffin Island, where he's, he was in search for food. And there was no more food because, you know, you, these guys are the ones that, you know, they, they rely on the ice to kind of be able to grab the seals when the seals pop up and just, you know, they use that as food. So I just put that out there just so you could see if you weren't already, <laughs> you weren't already shaken by these images. Well, you know, it's also affecting. So it's, a, it's a, the whole ecosystem of food sustainability, um, you know, labor, how, you know, our dependence on cheap labor and our, our ultimate uh, sort of, uh, our, you know, the thing is that we, a lot of this is, you know, we, we can talk about, we can talk about how lot, all of this is policy and agreements that get negotiated at higher levels, but the reality is that we, we bring it down to the ground. This has to do with consumption trends in the United States, and really it's, it's an educational piece that um, most of us are very, very much, um, you know, part of this consumerism um, pattern set that just don't, you know, we're, we're just kind of addicted to it. Um, what can we do? Um, oh, TPS. TPS, I, again, I don't want to make this my, I think I'm already over my time. But for those of you that may not know, TPS is Temporary Protected Status. It's an immigration, not a program, but it's a, an act that was passed by Congress in 1990 to provide relief to about 350,000 people from uh, Honduras, El Salvador, Nicaragua, and Haiti to be able to um, bring them to the United States and give them relief um, from uh, es essentially as a way to get them out of um, this natural disaster. And uh, if, if there was the natural disasters in their countries or like civil, civil conflicts, um, it, it allowed people to stay in the United States. However, it only gave them a work permit, uh, relief from deportation, um, and these, this program has not had uh, a path to legal permanent residency or a path to citizenship. Um, I put this slide in here just because this is another, this is a patch, not a solution. Uh, again, it, it's part of this, our failed immigration system that has not um, you know, we, it's very antiquated. We, we haven't updated it. Um, this is another population that will be affected. Um, you know, President Trump has recently repealed 
um, the two of them are postponed, the one for Haiti, and then is repealing the one from Honduras. And we think that El Salvador is coming down the pipeline in the next 30 days. So we're kind of bracing ourselves for that. Um, and, um, yeah, that's, that's where we're at right now. What to do? Um, so briefly, what to do? We believe as Alianza America that this issue, the issue of um, forced migration, how climate is impacted, how um, issues of, of trade deals, we really have to have the migrant and, and workers' voices at the center of everything we do. Um, we, you know, everything that Sharon shared, you know, is really disturbing in the sense that we see that this is a train that is moving at, you know, it's like, it's like a bullet. We don't know where it's going. A lot of this information is not open the, or the, the public regular, the public doesn't have access to it. You know, we really, we also think we need to have an intersectional cross-sector approach to how we think and talk about these issues. We can no longer stay in our little silos and, you know, the trade workers kind of work on their trade deals and we work on migration. That That's like sort of, <laughs> that's so yesterday. Um, and then again, I think this was already mentioned, but we, we really need a people first narrative and an agenda that prioritizes people or profit. Um, we need to be able to influence foreign policy via legislation and advocacy. Um, we see on these images that, you know, people around the world have been, they, you know, the TPP was, is, was very toxic. People in Japan adamantly opposed it. Um, people in Mexico are adamantly opposing really any negotiation of NAFTA. By, by people, I mean more of the agricultural sector. Um, they've seen firsthand what it's done to them and their families. So they don't want it. I uh, was reading some of research around this, and they don't. They don't. They just don't want it. Uh, trade agreements must also be fair, hum- humane, sustainable, and prior- prioritize workers. So, I'll leave it there. Thank you. Oh, thank you very much. <laughs> I would now like to introduce Anthony uh, Torres. Anthony Vidal Torres is associate campaign representative for Sierra Club's Responsible Trade Program. We've had him with us before. He's a member of the Climate Justice Working Group and advisory board member of the California Trade Justice Coalition. Anthony joined the Sierra Club in the spring of 2016 to organize the club's field campaign against the Trans-Pacific Partnership. He is originally from Long Island, New York, and his work has focused on how to build new movements and a new politics for climate justice. He has recently been featured as one of Grist.org's top 50 fixers for 2017 for his cross-movement building for a united multiracial front. Welcome, Anthony. Thank you, Harriet, and thank you to all the other folks at the Trade Justice Alliance and all the other speakers on this webinar. Uh, happy again to join you all in uh, brainstorming uh, how we're going to, uh, you know, again, advance trade justice in this era where we're fighting so many fires, some of them very literal. Um, and so for my portion of this webinar, I'd like to provide an update on where we are at in the NAFTA renegotiations uh, when it comes to energy. And then I'm going to go into uh, one of the recent opportunities we had um, in D.C. to uh, uplift how NAFTA has impacted communities of color. And finally close with how you all can take action uh, right now in this coming week. And so to start uh, this uh, is there's now, um, right now we're having the sixth round of the NAFTA talks that are being held in Washington, D.C. And uh, we've seen a bit of turbulence between the three countries. Um, however, uh, the, where, those, where Mexico, the United States, and Canada all agree is uh, on the energy chapter. And unfortunately for us on this call, their agreement lies in locking in fossil fuel dependency across North America and enshrining in an energy chapter um, the privatization of the fossil fuel industry in Mexico, as well as um, ensuring that pipelines can cross borders uh, much more easily and without without obstacles and input from communities 
um, when it comes to an updated NAFTA. And so for us at the Sierra Club, of course, this is um, very concerning because despite any promises uh, from the Trump administration, what we know is just because of those who are sitting in his billionaire cabinet that they're, um, they're going to profit uh, directly from the ability of their friends in big oil uh, developing pipelines across not just from Canada, what we've been fighting so far are tar sands pipelines coming in from Canada because of the original NAFTA. And the original NAFTA held a proportionality clause that, uh, that mandated Canada export a certain number of tar sands oil into, into the United States every year and has made it that much more difficult for uh, our friends in Canada to restrict uh, the development of tar sands. And now in this new NAFTA, uh, the outgoing government of Peña, uh, Peto Nieto in, in uh, Mexico, they want to lock in some of the uh, changes they made to Mexican law that privatizes their industry, and then in addition, uh, makes it that much easier for American companies to come in and develop uh, fracking in northern Mexico uh, to send to refiners in Texas. And so this is a huge threat to not only our ability to, in the future, past uh, when we have to even deal with, with Donald Trump, our ability to reign in climate change. It also um, ha- impacts so many communities from the border and beyond who are winning many, many fights against pipelines um, and can prevent our eventual victory over many of these companies. And so that's the update when it comes to the danger we're seeing in the NAFTA negotiations when it comes to energy. Uh, What I would like to go into is how, as Christina mentioned, how we're breaking down our silos and in this moment of danger, how we're moving ahead by by bringing people together across communities to bring awareness around the few, the, the areas that have been left in the dark about NAFTA and actually use that to fuel our power, a collective power and movement building ahead. And so just this past week, uh, actually uh, two weeks ago, uh, the Sierra Club co-sponsored a briefing on Capitol Hill with Representative Keith Ellison, in which I moderated a panel with, with Representative Ellison as well as uh, representatives from the Movement for Black Lives, immigrant rights organizations, indigenous rights organizations, and unions and demonstrating how NAFTA has specifically um, negatively impacted communities of color very uh, very intentionally and very in- intensely. And that included uh, Colette and Sean Battle, that included Erica and Diola, Tara Hauska, and Michael Smith, uh, each of them movement leaders uh, leading communities in fights for dignity, respect, and protection um, long before the Trump era and especially right now. And it was really powerful um, to have to be sitting at that table with um, all these incredible and inspiring leaders who were also raising up how NAFTA has specifically led to the elimination of jobs for black and brown workers and how in the United States and how at the same time uh, migrant workers and migrant women and, and, and communities in northern Mexico have been forced to face the brunt of workers' rights violations and environmental pollution that has been pushed across south of the border. And then moving on, how indigenous communities, of course, are on the front lines of fighting off these pipelines after pipelines. And so uh, it was a really critical moment, not only for us to get this in the narrative, but also to... Uh, let even our progressive leaders in Congress like Keith Ellison and others know that the forefront of any progressive NAFTA replacement platform at the core must uh, remedy the impact it has had on communities of color. And so I can pass on to Harry and others the Facebook Live link that you all can actually view the recording of that, that amazing discussion we had at the briefing. And finally, I want to go into how you all can have an impact this coming week. So on December 13th, 
we are going to be hosting a rally with Senator Bernie Sanders on our commitment to a NAFTA replacement and holding the Trump administration accountable in Washington, D.C. And that is going to uh, occur at the same time that NAFTA negotiators are meeting uh, separately in a hotel in, in our nation's capital. And we want to make sure that across the country, our voices are loud and clear and making sure that uh, those negotiators know that uh, they don't just have to worry about the corporate lobby. They actually have to worry about uh, hearing our voices and making sure that uh, they are held accountable to working people across North America. And so to do that, you can sign up on the slide. You can see that uh, you can sign up for our thunderclap uh, and Metaphorically, a thunderclap is where you're able to uh, get all of your supporters on your Facebook, your Twitter, across your social media, uh, signing up and spreading the word on that same day, simultaneously sharing, uh, the, sharing your support for a NAFTA uh, replacement that upholds workers' rights, environmental protection, and uh, beats back corporate power. And in addition to signing up for the Thunderclap, if you are a member of any local, regional, or national organizations that you'd like to join the Thunderclap and increase the magnitude of the amount of people we're reaching, I think right now we're, we, our reach is about a million people. And we really want to get that up to two or three million. And so if you're a part of an organization that can uh, sign up and uh, sign up their list to the Thunderclap, there's another link there for you um, for them to send out an email. And then lastly, of course, if you're in the Washington, D.C. area, uh, we'd love to have you attend our rally at 11 a.m. Uh, at one of the Senate office buildings uh, in D.C. And if you're not, of course, to watch the uh, recordings and share them on your platforms. Uh, so that's it for me, um, the updates uh, Great. we have at the Sierra Club. And, yeah, happy to take any questions. Thanks again. Okay, we'll open um, uh, the mics. Uh, for any questions for um, Christina and Anthony, or Christina or Anthony. You still with us, Christina? Uh-oh. Yes, I'm here. <laughs> I'm here. Okay. I was a little nervous. Okay, thank you. All right, so press star six if you have a question for Christina or Anthony. Well, we've got a few people in the queue, so. Here we go. All right, everybody ready? Okay, first caller, area code 610, your line is open. Um, I'm, this is for Anthony. Uh, is there a recording of the um, uh, Keith Ellison briefing? Yes, there is, and I'll pass that on to Harriet uh, tonight or in the morning. Thank you. All right, thank you. Our next caller is at area code 206. Your line is open. Yes, hi. Um, this is Selden Prentice, and my question for either Anthony or Christina, um, maybe Christina might know a little more about this. If NAFTA were to disappear, if it were not able to be renegotiated, um, do, how likely is it that Mexican farmers could regain some of what they've lost over the last 20-some years? Yeah, hi. Um well, it, it would take a, a real um, effort on behalf of um, government in, 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 Me in Mexico to work with local farmers to institute some of the uh, measures that were actually in place even before NAFTA kicked in. So what the government in Mexico has done um, over the years, at least over the last 40 years, is slowly but surely um, privatized. So they they've done you know with the same sort of um, the same pen that that you know we're in or the same pattern in that we're we've been moving into to sort of privatize everything because you know the sense that the that that the uh, public sector is not is no good. Um, they've been repealing or they had slowly been repealing a lot of subsidies and, and programs that benefited farmers. Um, and so they had a lot of these um, programs, programs in place. And so it would take a real 
sort of sitting down with the agricultural sector, with all of the organizers and the advocates to sort of lay out how to make, to be able to make um, small businesses or small farmers profitable again. Um, it would take, a, <laughs> so we're talking about a whole complete rehaul, revamp, um, but, but at least in our perspective, we don't think it's not doable. Um, Mexico is rich in agricultural. Um, the, the land is, is, is great for farming. Um, people that have, you know, were, were born into this sector, they know a great deal about farming. And so this is the, the, a lot of the, um, the skill set. Um, and, you know, I mean, these, these are, this is what families have sort of lived off of. They lived off of the land. And when, when we came in with these um, sort of big industrial, industrialized concepts of um, doing massive farming practices, well, they were no longer able to, to compete. Um, but so it would take a lot of political will. Um, obviously, we have we see that Mexico has a president that, to a certain extent, agrees with a lot of the policies that U.S. is, you know, essentially kind of shoving down its throat. But they willingly accept it. Um, it's you know we see it's a lot of pro quo uh, that 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 is taking place. But um, I mean, it, 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 it sounds like it's a long shot, but it's um, something that, you know, the, the, uh, the, the government there would really need to invest in, uh, into, the, into the public sector. Thank you. Okay. Our next question comes from Alan. Your line is open. Thank you very much. Um, I have a – I'm calling from British Columbia, Canada, and this is a question for both – Christina and Anthony, would Sierra Club or Alianza Americas be willing to join a task force to provide the case for economic democracy and publicly generated credit to the Bank for International Settlements? Would one of you like to take on that question? <laughs> I, I'd, I'd, I would love to talk offline and, and learn a little more <laughs> um, before I can say we, we, we do. But we're, we're very um, collaborative and, you know, we like to, this is all about opening up new relationships and alliances with, with folks that we're not working with so that we can leverage our voices. Um, so the quick answer would be yes, but I, I would obviously, you know, we would need to talk offline and, and you know, have a greater understanding for what that would look like. I can connect the two of you, af, uh, you know, after the call. Thanks very much, Harriet. Appreciate You're it. You're welcome. Thank you, Alan. Okay. Our next question comes from Nancy. Your line is open. Hello. This is, uh, again, Nancy Price from Davis, California. Um, I'd particularly like to ask Christina, um, could you tell us a little something about the mobilization um, for a better NAFTA or no NAFTA in Mexico? Thanks very much. Um, yeah, I so did a little bit of, of, of research. I know there is one campaign, and this is not the only one. And I, 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 I'm going to preface my answer by saying I, I'm probably not going to give you the best answer, but um, there is a, a campaign called Sin Maiz No Hay País, without corn, there is no country um, that I'm aware of that has been pushing far and large for a while now for um, the removal of NAFTA. And I can actually put together some of the articles. Unfortunately, a lot of these might be in Spanish, but I can actually put together some resources after this call in the, sen in the form of like articles and maybe even websites that might point to that. Um, I can send that to Harriet and Mara, but I'm not readily able to speak on sort of local efforts that at least we're involved in or that I know about beyond that. Well, uh, maybe, Anthony, do you know um, from uh, Sierra Club efforts and, and your allies and coalitions what's going on in Mexico? Yeah, we do have some allies in 
some of the um, you know environmental sector as well as the human rights and uh, human rights allies. And uh, I know our director Ben Beachy has met with some of the uh, freely associated union leaders. Um, and there have been several large marches in Mexico City um, during their negotiating rounds. And overall, a lot of it's wrapped up. Um, the energy is wrapped up in their presidential election. And so NAFTA is very much intertwined with those electoral efforts. Thank you, Anthony. So could I just make a comment? Sure. Uh, so I... Um, this has been a very good call, and, and, and the other programs have just been excellent. I guess, uh, listening to Sharon, I'm feeling quite panicked, actually, <laughs> because mm-hmm. it took us uh, almost two, two and a half, three years to educate the public on the TPP, and, to, um, and of course, we went into an election year, which was of some help, you could say, and now we're going into an election year again. But I'm feeling that the, that the general public is not as well educated, or at least the public that has always been interested in trade agreements uh, is not so educated about what's going on with NAFTA too. And there's a lot of sort of false claims about what corporations want or do want or what the USTR wants or doesn't want. And um, I think we can end up just being very schnookered here. So I'm feeling very panicked that I don't feel the same – mobilization or I don't seem the same feel the same upwelling and um, I'm not quite sure <laughs> I'm not quite sure where we're going on this uh, and and what how effective we're going to be so um, I just want to put that out there and um, uh, say that I appreciate uh, Christina and uh, Anthony what what you're both doing I'm just wondering how we can after the as we go into January, how we can um, ramp this up a bit. Thank you very much. Okay. Thanks for that. Thanks for that comment. I just wanted to add in that I definitely hear that. And, you know, it's also very difficult given, you know, the many different attacks uh, many of us, you know, are facing all at once. Um, Yes. I would say one sense of encouragement I'd like to offer is, um, at least on our end uh, with our CR club team, we've been seeing a level of engagement on trade that um, consistently that we actually haven't, didn't even see until the peak periods of TPP. And so we were actually very surprised recently at a team meeting to say, hey, you know, we actually are getting similar levels of engagement, even given all the things that are, you know, diverting other people's intentions, uh, yeah. you know, in a very meaningful way. And so right now, I think the strategy for our movement has been, you know, creating that high bar of that, what our NAFTA replacement uh, platform is. And in some ways, we're seeing that success in the delays that the Trump administration has been having in their negotiation, because right now they know they cannot sell this any deal they've been able to make so far. And so in many ways, uh, that pressure point is something that we succeeded in preventing them from getting a worse deal at the moment. And so, yeah, that's the kind of energy we'll have to carry forward, um, especially as we, you know, deal with this very sort of awkward dance um, as these negotiations try to quicken to a, to a close. But at least right now, one victory we do have is that the Trump administration wasn't able to deal, seal the deal that they wanted uh, by the end of the year, which was this month. And, who knows if they'll be able to do so but in the later this winter. So thank you. Quite true. Okay. Our next question comes from Paul. Your line is open. Yeah, thank you. Uh, just on the tail of what uh, Anthony said in terms of uh, trying to seal a, a worse deal or no deal, um, it seems like Given the timetable that we're on, the only realistic things, the only realistic options are just those: a worse deal, the same deal, or no deal. And if that's the case, then why not uh, marry with the the um, the indigenous, the migrant voices and the 
next invoices, which are saying no deal, and just just let that let that be, and hold hold Trump's feet to the fire, saying we're we're out. Um, for example, um, one thing that I know what would happen is um, uh, tra- uh, TransCanada has already um, or uh, the, the, the uh, trans the the Keystone XL pipeline has dropped their NAFTA suit. So they'd have to hurry up and, and build it before we get out of NAFTA. So that'd be one advantage. Another one would be that um, I know Lone Pine has been in uh, in national dispute settlement over um, uh, fracking uh, around the the uh, in in Quebec, and I can't imagine how getting out of NAFTA would make that any worse. Um, so there's two there's two situations with both countries right now which which aren't definitely not going to get any worse if we get out of NAFTA and could only get better. So I would like to I'd like to hear what uh, the two of you would have to say about those consider the, those considerations being out of NAFTA completely. Yeah. I mean, Christina, you can go. Well, <laughs> well I was going to just say that um, as an advocacy organization that has um, you know our our sort of feet on the ground in terms you know through through our members through our members work and the people that we advocate for um one of the things that we did um in September was um we do we do these um what we call um speaking and listening tours where we bring speakers from in this case Mexico and from Honduras and we do a tour um an educational tour um to really bring sort of voices from the other side of the border of our border to the United States to sit down um, at the table and have dialogue, constructive dialogue um, around how have these these types of policies impacted people not only over there but here. So, um, so what we saw during that tour it was a ten day tour through the Midwest specifically, and we did collaborate with the Sierra Club on one of these in one of these spaces in in Minneapolis, for example. Um, we also collaborated with the IATP, um, you know, being the experts on agricultural and trade as well. And, and you know, what we're hearing on the ground from ordinary Americans here is that they don't want it either. <laughs> so they, they've seen themselves affect their neighbors, um, you know, friends. They've seen themselves affected. And one of the things that we are going to be doing more of in 2018 is to um, do more of that. Um, and we plan to do more um, engagement work in the Midwest. Of course, we're only one organization um, leveraging our, <laughs> our small budget, um, you know, but that is an angle in which we are investing in. Um, we're definitely trying to ramp up um, how we position ourselves and how we talk about these issues, um, you know, and trying to bring the key partners to the table. So in that sense, we have, you know, taken some preliminary steps to move in that direction. Um, You know, we were also, of course, you know, seeking more funding to be able to carry these out in a more organized and more sustainable way throughout 2018. Um, That might not solve the immediate uh, that might not be an answer to the immediate problem of stopping TPP, or sorry, NAFTA 2.0. <laughs> uh, um, but we do think that um, if we work in a coalition of voices that are, um, you know, voices that are local, um, you know, fa- local farmers, um, local workers, small businesses here in the U.S., and folks on the other side, that we are in a better position to do that. Um, also, I mean, we have to remember the folks that voted for Trump sometimes <laughs> are not, um, we also have to sit down at the table with these folks. So it's not that, you know, it's just going to be folks that are on our side and they think like us and look like us. No, it's going to be a broader, more diverse coalition than that. So, um, you know, I just want to put that out there and say that at least those are the the types of steps we're taking um, because we really believe that, you know, if we come at it from a, a multiple viewpoint perspective that we'll have a better chance to, to influence the minds and, and the hearts of people um, that will then sort of take that and, and move within their own spaces, their own networks and their own 
sort of advocacy channels to be able to, to take this message. So if you will, we're, we're changing narrative um, and we're doing it with, you know, big partners like Sierra and IATP and sort of we're leveraging this um, collectively. Great. Hi, this is Anthony. That's what I love. I think this hear. is. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. I think this is a really critical question, and you know, one that uh, I think all of us are wrangle with um, have been wrangling with. And what I have to say is, um, one is it's very obvious the Trump administration is their number one goal is to seal a worse deal for our climate and our community. Right. Um, it's very clear from who's negotiating, who's in the room. Um, you know, it's the corporate interests. It's those that we are battling on many other fronts who um, have influence um, and um, in which, you know, Trump from the very beginning, you know, was able to co-op this language and co-op sort of our righteous anger at, uh, you know, the status quo of trade deals and, you know, underneath the, that veil, be able to try to negotiate a worse deal and sell it back to the public. And now that he's not been able, of course, to seal yet another deal um, and not get another win on his agenda, um, he's now saying he just wants to go out and withdraw. And, you know, for us as those who've opposed, you know, SNAFTA from the beginning, um, at first it's like, okay, yeah, but the two buts are here. One is... We know that over the 20, past 20 years, our trade policy overall, even without NAFTA, has evolved to support the various, those very same policies. So it's not just withdrawing and walking away from the table that's good enough. We actually have to have a replacement, uh, poli- replacement policies that not only roll back the damage that NAFTA has done and get rid of those protections, but we also have to be able to uh, implement a 21st century trade policy that reinforces our human rights, climate, and workers' obligations and raises the bar. So that's one, but another is, you know, uh, we also have to be remember that uh, Trump did campaign on, the, on this NAFTA and that if he's able, when he's had so many losses on, on every other battle, able to paint and persuade the public that his withdrawal, it was his decision and his was through his own strength alone and not because of the decades of movements that have been opposing NAFTA and then TPP, um, you know, we'll see, you know, we'll see him be able to score political points and use that, that leverage to pummel us on other issues. And so it's a really delicate dance we have um, ahead of us. And so that's why I think, you know, the replacement platform and having that high bar is so important, not just, on the reality um, of trade policy, but also on the politics and looking ahead about how we have to build uh, our political power and not lend it to our opponents. Excellent, great. Thank you very much. Uh, very That's quickly, okay. so, so what worries me is that we can uh, um, mobilize and speak a lot about 21st century um, trade agreement and what we want and what needs to be in there, but we won't know what's in the text until it's presented to Congress on fast track when there's no amendments possible and it's up and down uh, majority vote. And we all know that CAFTA squeaked through on one vote and there's other examples of squeak throughs. So it makes me, again, I have to repeat that it makes me very nervous that we can ask for all these things, but we won't know what's in the text until it's presented on fast track and there's no amendments. So um, please uh, encourage me that we can get what we want in the text and um, somehow we'll know that it's there before it's presented to Congress. Hi, Without this is Anthony. Late. <laughs> um, so uh, I think the answer here is a complicated one. One is we're trying to get, you know, be loud about our demands. One, to try to slow down uh, the Trump uh, renegotiation process and make sure that they do uh, feel the heat and the pressure from many of our sides, and not just here in the U.S., but also in Canada and Mexico, to adhere to our demands. But two, we're under no illusion that um, Mm -hmm. Trump is going to agree to many, if at all, of our demands. And so that's why actually the key uh, if you look at so the thunderclap and uh, all the other efforts that we're doing this week, 
that message is being relayed to members of Congress and members of Congress right now because when they, so that when they read the text of any new NAFTA 2.0, they also already have in their heads all of the demands and the rubrics for success that uh, we've been making clear for weeks and months beforehand. And so the point there in our efforts is to get ahead of Trump with Congress and make sure that we already instill a popular and progressive standard for trade so that any worse deal from these renegotiation efforts cannot and will not have the votes to pass Congress, similar to what we did with TPP. Thank you. Very good. Thank you. Okay. Um, so I believe that was the last question, unless um, uh, Christina wants to chime in on that one. Are you still with us, Christina? No. I, well, yeah, I'm here. I just, I just, I would echo um, Anthony's. Uh, okay. words i think yeah we just need to be very ready to <laughs> arm our people with the <laughs> knowledge and the talking points that they need to make those phone calls and you know to make noise so um best case scenario is we stop it from from from, from moving great Thank you very much, you two. And don't forget, everybody, to join the Thunderclap. That's, uh, you have to sign up for it. You can sign up for it any time. And the Thunderclap itself is going to be on the 13th, and that's when we're all going to be calling our members of Congress and letting them know uh, we, need a, a, uh, we need to replace NAFTA the trade, with trade that uplifts people and the planet. Thank you both so much. Um, okay, thank we're you. Gonna, thank you. Thank you so much. We're gonna we're gonna uh, uh, go back now. We're gonna see. Uh, poor Eleanor was never able to jump on. I feel really bad about that. Um, we usually don't have that problem. Uh, but um, let's see if I can find those slides. And um, Mara, is your line open? Let's yes, I on. am. I'm okay. here. Okay, beautiful. Let me let me uh, let me find the slides. <laughs> we'll run okay. through them. I know they're not your slides. However, I know you understand uh, the issue because you have been working uh, with the Battle for the Net campaign. So as soon as I get them here, we'll. I'm a little more familiar with the domestic campaign than with the uh, NASA campaign, unfortunately. That's okay. Um, and there's been um, some development that's all right. recently. Yeah, that's fine. First, um, I, I would like to give Eleanor credit for this. So yeah. uh, Mara, Mara, of course, is one of our trade justice uh, team members. She's um, basically my partner in, uh, in crime here. Uh, but, you know, Eleanor is a wonderful uh, guest speaker and activist, and I'm really very sorrowful that she couldn't be on. So I am going to read her bio and give her the credit that she deserves. Eleanor Goldfield is a creative activist, journalist, and poet. She is the founder and co-host of the creative and grassroots activism show Act Out, which airs on Free Speech TV, and that's on Dish Network, Direct TV, Roku, Amazon Fire, and others. Her spoken word performances blend visual projections and politically charged poetry. She uh, has a book of poems and activist artist work, and they, that book is going to be released in 2017 um, on Styx Forlag in Sweden. She was um, also the co-founder and singer of Rooftop Revolutionaries, a political rock band born from the fight against capitalism and all the evils that stem from it. Besides speaking and performing, Eleanor assists in local action organizing activism trainings and she is currently based in DC and um, you know anytime you go up to uh, DC for any of these uh, anti TPP uh, or any anti corporate uh, events you can uh, better believe uh, Eleanor will be there with her microphone and she'll be uh, interviewing so she's an amazing human being so um, right now we're going to open the mic uh, for Mara Cohen and uh, she is going to be uh, speaking in um, in Eleanor's place, since Eleanor uh, had uh, technical issues with the phone tonight. So uh, thanks very much, Mara. You're on. Yes, thank you, Harriet. Um, the first thing I'd like to say, which um, 
Eleanor first, is that the FCC is going to vote on repealing the Title II status of the Internet on the 14th. And what this means is that Ajit Payi, who is the, the chairman of the FCC now, um, is a former executive at Verizon, and this will put the, the uh, Internet back into um, not being a private uh, public utility, but will essentially belong to the big um, ISP provider, ISPs uh, like Verizon, Comcast, and AT&T. Um, they will be given full reign of the Internet with the ability to do everything, including censor content. Um, we need people, this is not part of NASA right now, but we need people to participate in this campaign. Uh, Eleanor suggests calls and emails to Congress and gives the, the website for battleforthenet.com where you can um, sign a petition and it will set you up automatically for calls to Congress that you can uh, just continue calling different people in Congress. It will hook you up directly and give, us, give you a script that you can use. Um, the other things that are happening on December 13th, there will be an overnight vigil. And on the 14th, for before the vote and during the vote, there will be a morning action on, in, on December 14th. Um, that will be in Washington, D.C., and we're hoping to have as many around the country as possible. Um, you can go to bit.ly, stop the FCC vote. That's B-I-T dot L-Y, stop the FCC vote, to sign up and learn more about the vigil and the morning actions. There's another thing that's happening on the 12th that if you belong to an organization or have a large um, website, uh, a website or um, have a large Facebook population, if you go to, I guess it would be Stop the FCC Vote also, um, you can find out how to become part of Break the Net, which will be December the 12th and is an effort to embed code that will perform in certain ways on your uh, website. Um, so look that up too. The connection to trade, um, this is what I'm not, right, I'm doing this very extemporaneously. Um, the big corporations are making the calls on this. Um, in the TPP we saw that they wanted to exploit the opportunity to put into the trade agreement and this is very similar what they're doing with uh, with uh, NASTA, all the laws, all the regulations or anti-regulations that they could not pass in the U.S. Congress. For years they've been trying to pass deregulation of the net similar to what they're doing right now um, and we're not able to do so. Um, and they, they have put it, written it fully into, into the trade agreements. One of the interesting things about trade now is that it's beginning to morph more and more into services, agree, agreement about services, trade and services, and um, private property, pro, uh, inter, um, intellectual property rights, and all kinds of things like that, copyright law, that extensively impact on the Internet and people's ability to uh, reproduce information, such as in the left press and other other things that we need to be concerned about. Now, this was a huge problem for uh, NASA uh, negotiators because there was such an outcry. The Internet community is very well organized. Um, you'll find that when you get involved in the battle for the net, which I hope you get involved in. Um, they were able to make enough noise that the negotiators have paid lip service to it and are saying that they are going to greatly modify the um, chapter on on uh, internet provisions, but we have yet to see what's going to end up in the um, final agreement. And some of us are very happy about this. Some of us are not taking it so seriously. Let's see. Oh, okay. I cannot read this quote from the EFS because I am visually impaired. Okay. 
I can. I don't read know it. what it's, it's saying. Okay, I'll, thank I'll you. I'll read that. I'll just read that. Um, okay. This is a que- uh, a uh, a quote from Electronic Frontier Foundation. This has to do with. Uh, trade. The big tech companies are now wielding increasing influence with the U.S. trade representative and demanding that it negotiate rules that protect their businesses, like prohib- prohibitions against restrictions on the cross-border transfer of data. And what that okay. refers to is that people um, like to be able to transfer data from one country to another. And one of the ways that this is done is to send it from one server to another um, overseas and be able to ping it from server to server, from country to country. And this is one of the things that would be made illegal uh, in the uh, provisions in in, um, NASTA. And uh, people uh, people who were using servers would have to use domestic servers only. So it's complicated, but it would end up being a very restrictive and bad thing, and this is one of the things that they're saying they they will negotiate with. Um, I can't read this slide either, so it's either self-explanatory or you can read Um, it to me. Let's see, (laughs) and the intellectual property and the copyright provisions. Mm. Um, There are lots of questions about that. Uh, For example, will someone uh, be arrested for sharing a picture on Facebook? Um, And will we see the resurgence of SOPA or PIPA style legislation, uh, which there was such an uproar over that that never got brought up for a vote? Um, You might remember that a number of years back. Um, And... um, As of September, EFF noted Canada's pushback against U.S. copyright demands, but the battle is far from over. I can guarantee a big part of these trade agreements is going to be um, about digital rights. Yes, Um, absolutely. So uh, let's see. You can – I think what you can just do, Mara, is just give – Maybe a summation about you know what people can do again, and then okay, that would, that'll be good. Um, the important things to do right now on the domestic front are to go to Battle of the Internet. Actually, it's called Battle of the Net. I'm sorry, BattleoftheNet.com. Sign the petition, which will then take you to making calls. I, I'm not sure if you have to sign the petition, but it's a good idea. That's how we got Title II in the first place. We got millions of signatures on it. Um, so this petition should be equally big, and then it will take you where you can call Congress, and I very much ask you to do that. The uh, request we're making of Congress is that they contact uh, con- uh, Congress people is that they contact personally in the FCC chair, Ajit Pai, and demand that he does not put this vote forward. Um, We're trying to stop the vote. Um, Another thing you can do is join Team Internet, which is kind of coordinating this whole thing. Um, There's things to do anywhere from helping people figure out where to go for the for the, uh, the the vigil and the morning um, demonstrations to um, well, there's just all things all kinds of things that they need help with and it's really this week that's desperate so even if yeah. you can do an hour or two um, that'd be terrific and that's at the bitly uh, bitly um, stop the FCC stop FCC vote um, okay. if you go there it's bit.ly stop FCC vote. Okay, so um, the big thing is, too, when you call your member of Congress, you know, which I can't uh, recommend highly enough, um, there, some of them are going to try to tell you that it's not going to be a congressional vote, so they're trying to get at, weasel out of it that way. But I guarantee that if enough members of Congress, um, you know, are hounded about this, because this is a huge issue, it, it it trumps pretty much every other campaign right yeah. now that's in the public, uh, you know, in the public uh, domain. And, um, you know, they're going to try to tell you uh, there's nothing they can do about it. But believe me, there is something they can do about yes. it. They can demand um, that Ajit Pai uh, abandon what he's doing and abandon, uh, you know, he he is just – he makes jokes about it. He thinks mm-hmm. he has no qualms about stealing the Internet from us at all. 
So, uh, and one got, thing I'll add is that there were 700 demonstrations at 700 Verizon stores last Wednesday. Yeah. And the day before that, um, Ajit Pai went and spoke at Verizon headquarters, and that got plenty of publicity. And I have to say, I didn't hear a peep about the 700 demonstrations. So it's up to us to call our Congress people and tell them, get in touch with that guy and tell him that he may not hold this vote. So even if you have a champion of Internet neutrality as a congressperson, as I do, Mm -hmm. they need to contact Pay personally and tell him that. Because our our ability to organize is at stake, you know, really. Okay. All right, Mara, thank you so much. Thank Um, you. That was terrific. I'm glad you were able to fill in for for Eleanor. Um, Okay. So um, I wanted to um, remind all of you that um, we we still um, produce our videos after we do these uh, webinars, and um, we just if you want to access our webinars, uh, you can just go to tradejustice.net forward slash webinar vids. Um, and our wonderful Carrie Marks, she mixes the audio and visuals, and then uh, we send those out to you. I'm sure you know that we do that. But uh, everybody that signs up for these webinars, um, you can get those videos. And uh, the one thing we ask is that you really share that um, because, you know, uh, we really want to respect the wonderful speakers that we get. And the best way we can do that is to share uh, the message that they bring to these calls. So it's so important. And um, next, uh, we're almost out of here. Um, I just wanted to let you know we've moved our planning calls to Wednesday evenings. Um, they're now Wednesday. They have been on Tuesday for about for over four years. We've had them on Tuesday. We just changed them to Wednesday at 8 p.m., and the way you, if you want to join us on planning, we could use your help. Um, you just dial the same number you dialed to get into this uh, call tonight. And hopefully the phone will behave better than it did tonight. And uh, you uh, use the same access code. And, uh, you, you know, you can help us plan. Um, you, you can help us come up with topics and speakers and uh, help promote. You know, that's a big part of what we need, just promoting, even if it's uh, if you're good on social media. Uh, we could use help with that. And uh, if you have a desire to help us out monetarily, of course, we won't turn you down. You can toss a few bucks in the kitty if you go to tradejustice.net uh, forward slash TJA donate. And before we say good night, we'd, we'd like to thank you all for continuing to join us on um, our Sunday night webinars. We know um, there are a lot of things you could be doing tonight, and uh, we want you to know that we really appreciate that you chose to spend your time with us. And uh, from the Trade Justice team, we would like to wish you all a happy holiday season and a very happy new year. We'll we'll see you all um, in 2018. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Bye, everybody. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, everybody.